All right, so this is all about the brain and the body and the relationship between the two. Uh, so we look at some different biological aspects and brain development. One of the things that um, we should keep in mind too, especially when it comes to young children, is how important language is and and uh, language development for children. And so, you know, their first three years of life is so much that the kids are absorbing. And this can be a really beneficial time to introduce them to a variety of languages and really build that brain for, for language development. So we'll talk a little bit more about that too as we go through this chapter. So a biological psychologist or um, neuroscientist, uh, neuropsychologist, uh, <clears throat> are different terms that we could use to describe people that do research in this area. Uh, sleep and dreams, depression, schizophrenia, hunger and sex, stress and disease, these things correlate to one another. And so, you know, a, a biological psychologist that would be interested in studying people's dreams would obviously do that while they're sleeping. We could, you know, hook them up to different machines um, like the uh, ECT and get a scan of the brain waves and that can give us some indication as to this person's sleep patterns, um, how often they cycle through the sleep, uh, like N, uh, non-REM 1, non-REM 2, and non-REM 3, um, how long they're in REM sleep, uh, what stages of the night that they're sleeping in. So those kinds of things is what we would gather from that. Depression, schizophrenia, or obviously our psychological disorders and so with any of our mental illnesses we see different uh, hormonal and neurotransmitter changes so things we, we would want to be looking for is dopamine levels serotonin um, that type of thing and that can indicate the different uh, mental illnesses and as well as what medication might work the best for somebody with a mental illness Hunger and sex are both strongly linked to serotonin. Stress and disease go hand in hand with each other. You know, the more stressed we are, the more susceptible we are to disease. So we would want to see how the body would react uh, with different levels of stress when faced with different diseases. So these are just a handful of things that, you know, somebody that's studying uh, in this discipline or the brain in general uh, would want to research a little bit more. So Phineas Gage is probably somebody that you've heard of before. He's widely known and very popular to talk about in a multitude of classes. Uh, he's probably the most famous person that would have survived severe brain damage, especially at the time, you know, this accident occurred in the mid 1800s. Uh, this, there was an accidental explosion and a charge had set off and blew this steel rod, uh, like a tamp uh, tamping iron, and it went through his head. The frontal lobe of his head so this iron was about oh, three and a half feet long it weighed about 13 pounds uh, and it was about uh, a little over an inch in diameter like the the circumference of it so this is a pretty powerful force it knocked him over um, and most of the front, front part of his left side of the brain was destroyed but he survived, you know, surprisingly so. Like I said, in the mid-1800s, we didn't have the medical technology that we did today. Uh, even uh, several months after the accident, he felt strong enough to resume work. But what we learned is that he, uh, his personality had changed greatly. Uh, the contractors that employed him didn't want to give him his spot back. Uh, before the accident, he was super capable. He was a very efficient foreman. He had a well-balanced mind. Um, he was looked at as like a shrewd, smart businessman. And now he is grossly profane. He showed little difference for his fellows, uh, his fellow colleagues, uh, workers. He was very impatient. Um, he just no longer himself, you know, no, no longer the gauge that everybody knew. And so he did start to have epileptic epileptic seizures about a decade or so after the accident um, and he died on May 23rd of 1860 so that is how we learned uh, personality is housed in the frontal lobe of the brain is from Phineas uh, Gage's situation 
So prior to Phineas Gage, we looked at Franz Joseph Gall for some work that he did in phrenology. And phrenology is like the study of the, I guess, kind of bumps that people would have. Um, so, you know, you touch on somebody's brain or their head and I guess not the brain, but yeah, the head and, you know, based on the different indentations and things like that is how, we, how Gall came up with, um, you know, what part of the brain correlated with what action or what emotion or things like that. And uh, so at the time, though, you know, we didn't really know any better than what Gall had presented us with. And so Gall today is really considered um, a pseudoscience with the idea of phrenology. Uh, so there's no proof, really, that what he came up with in terms of which part of the brain housed different components, there, there was no accuracy to his findings. Um, and but But that being said, you know, he was the first one to kind of explore this and to open up and to try and give us an idea of, you know, what, what was going on in the brain. And so while phrenology is considered a pseudoscience today, and we have cases like Gage, you know, that um, taught us differently, you know, he was, he was one that really opened up the idea of studying the brain and uh, <clears throat> trying to differentiate, you know, what, what was going on in the brain and which part of the brain was, uh, responsible for different mental functions, right? So we did learn learn quite a bit from from Gall's uh, work that he did. All right, so hopefully we all know by now that our nervous system is broken down into two different parts, right? We we have the CNS and we have the PNS. The CNS is the central nervous system. The PNS is the peripheral nervous system. And so there's a, this is like the, the nervous system is the body's electro, electrochemical communication system. Right? And so there's four important characteristics that go along with the brain and the nervous system. And that is complexity, which is meaning that the brain is made up of billions of nerve cells. Um, the orchestration of these cells and how they're built allows a person to carry out a variety of activities. Integration uh, would be the next one, and that's how the brain integrates information from the environment so that people can function in the world. Each nerve cell in the brain communicates with some like 10,000 other nerve cells. And then there's adaptability, which is where we look at plasticity as well, meaning that the world constantly changes. And with that, the brain and the nervous system allow the person to adjust to the changes around them. And so this plasticity that we have is this vast capacity for modification and change. And then the fourth one is the electrochemical transmission. And that's our electrical impulses and chemical messenger system that allows the brain and the nervous system to work as an information processing system. And so as people interact with and adapt to the world around them, the brain and the nervous system receive and transmit incoming sensory information. The brain and the nervous system integrate this information and direct the body's motor activity. And so we look at things like the afferent nerves, which can carry information to the brain, brain and the efferent nerves uh, that carry information from the brain out to the body. And these neural networks are made up of nerve cells, and this is what uh, integrates the sensory input and motor output. So the CNS is the brain and the spinal cord uh, is what we see as part of the CNS. And so that allows us to receive the information. It allows us to process it, interpret it, you know, and then store the information that we're taking in, right? We typically take these, um, this information and we receive this information through our five senses. So the peripheral nervous system and the CNS, the central nervous system, kind of work hand in hand with each other. Um, you know, the CNS is the input and output, and then the PNS is, uh, you know, kind of the carrier of all the information. The peripheral nervous system consists of the nerves that connect the brain and the spinal cord to the other parts of the body. So we need those functioning with the CNS to be able to send and receive these messages all throughout. Uh, the function of the PNS is to direct the information as it comes in, as it's received to and from, you know, the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and so it also carries out the commands of the CNS as well. So the SNS here, our somatic nervous system, is kind of like the bones of the nervous system, which is why we sometimes refer to it as the skeletal nervous system. 
and with the SNS, uh, the somatic nervous system, we this system looks to convey the information from the skin and then the muscles and sends it to the CNS. It helps to regulate information such as signals about pain and temperature. Um, so it's, it has a separate role that it plays than what we see with the ANS, the autonomic nervous system. But this is anything that's voluntary. So, you know, you have a bug that lands on your arm. Think about like if a bee or a wasp lands on you, how long does it take you to respond before you're like flailing your arms around? Um, which is what my mother would do all the time when we were kids. Like she was terrified of bumblebees or wasps or anything like that. And so the minute it was on her, if, if it got a chance to land on her or anywhere close to her, her arms are just flailing everywhere. She's like screaming and running as funniest thing you've ever seen. Kind of embarrassing as a kid, but super, you know, funny looking back to see how terrified she was of this. But I totally understand on her part, you know, not funny at all. <laughs> Um, but it's a voluntary, you know, it's a voluntary action to flail your arms around like that, uh, writing your name, turning a light switch on and off. You know, these are all voluntary actions that are part of our somatic nervous system. So this falls underneath our peripheral nervous system, our PNS, you know, the PNS, um, and the CNS are like the two components of the nervous system, right? So the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And then the peripheral nervous system has the SNS, which is the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system, which we'll refer to as the ANS. So here's the ANS, right? The secondary part to the autonomic nervous system, or I'm sorry, to the peripheral nervous system, which is the autonomic nervous system. And with the autonomic nervous system, the function of this is to take the messages to and from the body's internal organs. Uh, thus, this helps regulate like breathing, heart rate, digestion. Um, the autonomic nervous system also has two more components, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system prepares a person for a stressful situation. And then the parasympathetic nervous system helps to calm that person down after the stressful situation. So the stress is the response of the individuals to stressors, circumstances, or events that threaten an individual's well-being. Uh, like when a person experiences stress, there's physiological changes that take place, such as sweating and elevated heartbeat. Exposure to this stressful situation can activate the sympathetic nervous system, which is like our fight or flight response. Uh, and so there's like acute stress, which is the momentary stress response. And this ends when this event, stressful event ends. And then there's chronic stress that occurs continuously. And in this type of stress, the nervous system sends out the um, stress hormones and that can wear down the immune system over time as well. But the autonomic nervous system with the like sweaty palms and having your cheeks feel hot and your heart pounding and things like that, like that's all part of um, your body's just kind of fight or flight natural response. And so our sympathetic nervous system kicks into gear. And when our cheeks start to cool down and our palms aren't so sweaty, that's your parasympathetic at work. And so if you've ever been driving along and you have like this, um, cap that's, that's all of a sudden behind you, right? Uh, you might not be doing anything wrong, but oftentimes people start to, you know, maybe get like a little queasy in their stomach or their heart starts to race or they feel like the butterflies in their stomach and that's their nerves, right? That's the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system that's kicking into gear. Um, <clears throat> and so it's just kind of our body's natural response to, you know, something that we might fear or something that we feel uncomfortable. If you've ever been on an interview before, you uh, often have those sweaty palms and it's like, that's the worst time, right? You don't ever want to have sweaty palms when you're, you know, about to shake somebody's hand that you meet for the first time. But that's, you know, again, just your peripheral nervous system, your autonomic nervous system, your sympathetic um, nervous system that's all at work that's, you know, making your palms a little bit sweaty. So you just have to kind of breathe through the moment, you know, try and relax and uh, let your, you know, parasympathetic happen over time and, and your body will return to kind of like a normal state. Let me tell you guys a little bit story. Uh, so I had this interview once and it was, I didn't take the position, but it was for college and it was, uh, it wasn't teaching though. It was like, um, like more of like a sales. So you go out to different high schools and talk to them about, you know, why they should join this college and why they should attend here. Anyway, so during the interview, it was me 
And then there was like four or five people that were sitting around the table interviewing me, which already is a little bit nerve wracking to have so many people throwing questions at you. Uh, so I'm sure my, uh, you know, peripheral nervous system, autonomic, sympathetic nervous system was all in high gear already because it was a, kind of a stressful situation. But then they threw something at me totally out of the blue. And they're like, there's a, a bunch of items sitting on the table in front of me. And it was like a water bottle and a can of pop and uh, like little snack bags of food. And they're like, well, we're going to leave the room for a few minutes. We want you to pick one of these items. And when we get back, you have to sell us the item. And instantly my my body, my brain, everything goes into like panic mode. And they leave the room and I'm sitting there thinking like, oh my gosh, who can I call? Like, who can give me something really great to say last minute? And, you know, what am I going to do for this? Like, I have no idea. And I, I totally was not into like a sales job. Like, that's not what I was thinking this position was. And I'm thinking, no, that's going to take too long. Like, I can't... Uh, I can't call somebody. By the time I explain to them what I need, these people are going to be back. And what am I going to say? Anyway, so there's a can of like diet. I think it was Diet Pepsi sitting there. And if you've seen a can of Diet Pepsi or if you drink Diet Pepsi, it's kind of like a silver can. And you can see yourself, your reflection in it a little bit. And so I'm looking at this can and I'm thinking like this is a diet drink. And then I'm looking at myself and myself is like distorted a little bit in the can. And so... I was like, oh, well, this, this can kind of makes you look a little bit skinnier than maybe what you are, right? And so I came up with some line about, you know, how it's cool and it's crisp and it's refreshing. And, and then I was like, it's the only diet drink that you can work that makes it look like your diet is actually working because it distorts you, right? It makes you look super skinny. And so they thought that was hilarious, of course. So they're all laughing and Maybe at that point, my parasympathetic kicked in and I was like, okay, I can breathe again. Like, this is over. I made it through. Uh, so that was very, very nerve wracking to experience that. But an example also of acute stress, right? Because it's something that, you know, was temporary and did pass. And, you know, I was able to, you know, get that uh, parasympathetic working and back in place. So just kind of a, a very memorable, funny story uh, in, a, you know, it's, very memorable experience to have. So something I will never forget having to go through that. So you should see this link in, uh, in the folder in class too, but if not, you know, look up Jill Bolte Taylor, uh, look at, um, the name of the video is stroke of insight and it's a Ted talk, but it's also on YouTube. Anyways, she's a neuro, uh, scientist. That's what she does for the living is she studies the brain. And I think she's just really interesting uh, in terms of listening to her experience. So she walks you through the morning. She had a stroke. She was 38 years old when this happens. And I think she just has a little different insight into exactly what is going on and what happened because she studies the brain for a living. And so while your average person that doesn't study the brain for a living might not be able to recall and to kind of explain what was going on and what, you know, what they were feeling as well as she can. So she's, she's an interesting one to listen to. I, I like what she has to say. She does get, you know, a little bit, uh, maybe preachy towards the end, but I guess, you know, coming that close to death, it's, it's okay to, you know, to, to get a little, um, I preachy, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's the right word, I think. So I'd love to, you know, hear your thoughts in uh, the comment section, if you'd like on this recording. So there are several uh, neurons, neurotransmitters that serve as chemical messengers. Each plays a different role. They have its own function. Some neurotransmitters excite the neuron and cause it to fire, whereas others uh, inhibit the neuron. Some neurotransmitters are both excitatory and inhibitory. And so after that neurotransmitter crosses over the synaptic gap, it gets picked up by a receiving neuron. Most of these neurons pick up and secrete only one type of neurotransmitter. So on this slide, what you see is acetylcholine. This sets the firing of neurons into motion and is involved in muscle actions, learning as memory. And so you can see an up close image here of the acetylcholine at work. So this is a neurotransmitter that's in the CNS. It's in the central nervous system. can also be found in the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. Um, 
The neurotransmitters are chemical signals which are made by neurons to send information to associated receptors where information is received or blocked and processed into necessary action. Acetylcholine can do both. It can stimulate, which is excite, or it can inhibit, which is to block the responses for whatever desired, desired psychological, I'm sorry, physiological effect it would want. Uh, the acetylcholine has so many functions in the body. It's released uh, into the nerve synapses. It acts on the presynaptic or transmitter and the postsynaptic receiver. Uh, it helps to regulate blood pressure. So when blood flows, it creates fiction that can be seen on the image um, in here. You can see this uh, restriction that's going on a little bit. Uh, it also can help to smooth muscles. So those are the uh, contracting the smooth muscles. Muscles, those are the lining uh, of the walls of the organs of the tubular structures. Um, the smooth muscles uh, are in like our intestines, our bladder, our airway, our uterus, our blood vessels, our stomach. Acetylcholine is like the neuromuscular junction located between the motor nerve and the skeletal muscle. Uh, and so they have done so many different studies and things over the years, but it helps to, you know, stimulate uh, secretions. It can sometimes help to slow the heart rate um, and kind of get you back to your baseline if you, uh, you know, experience like that flight or flight, fight or flight uh, that we talked about a couple slides ago. So there's a lot of different responsibilities that our acetylcholine has. So you can see there's several neural transmitters in addition to the acetylcholine we mentioned on the last page, or last slide. And so uh, glutamate is the first one here. This has a key role in exciting many neurons to fire. It's also involved in learning and memory, which we saw on the with the acetylcholine as well. Um, of all the transmitters in the brain, glutamate is the most important for normal brain function. Aside from being the most abundant or excitatory neurotransmitter, it also plays, like I said, an important role in learning and memory. And so its main function is to transmit this information that regulates brain development and determines cellular survival. Uh, glutamate is present throughout the brain in high concentrations, but too much as well as too little can be dangerous. There must be exactly the right concentration in the correct location uh, in order for the proper length of time for process to be carried out without causing any kind of cell damage. Uh, glutamate is uh, also an amino acid, and so this makes proteins and performs metabolic functions. Uh, we didn't immediately recognize this as a neurotransmitter, uh, but it, it can also enable long-term uh, potentiation, which is the strengthening of signals between two neurons that occurs with frequent use. Uh, we see foods that are high in protein, like meats, dairy, eggs, cheese, high protein vegetables, all contain high levels of uh, glutamate acid. Um, and so, you know, we uh, also see glutamate, glutamate, which is commonly used as a flavor enhancer. Um, so when you see things that say MSG, MSG act activates flavor receptors like a savory, salty flavor. It's one of the most five basic human tastes. Um, MSG is commonly added to prepackaged foods like potato chips, some Asian foods. Um, it's also naturally in rel uh, relatively large proportions of, of breast milk is where we can find it. Uh, <clears throat> the flavor though of MSG can make food more appealing and there have been claims that it's addictive, uh, but you know, it is a little bit controversial. Um, there have been people that have been reported like having headaches or other neurological problems immediately after consuming MSG. However, the, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, considers MSG to be safe. And, you know, studies generally indicate that while some people may be sensitive to it, it's not connected to long-term neurological problems. At least that's what they're that's what they're claiming right now from the recent studies that's been done. Uh, neuroepinephrine is our second one, and this inhibits the firing of neurons in the central nervous system, but it excites the heart muscles, intense, uh, intestines, and the urogenital tract. 
uh, stress stimulates the release of norepinephrine. So that's another function that we see of it. Uh, and with uh, norepinephrine, <clears throat> this is, like I said, it's classified as an excitatory one, so it stimulates. When we have uh, low nor norepinephrine, uh, we can see side effects as well. Um, if, if it's, uh, if we're not, if our body's not producing enough of it. And so sometimes if we have low epinephrine, we, or I'm sorry, low norepinephrine, uh, we can see a loss of alertness. There can be memory problems. We can see this in people that are depressed. There's a lack of arousal or interest, foggy brain, fatigue, um, just un, being unmotivated, you know, that can be a result of not having enough norepinephrine. Um, so this generally helps to regulate, you know, if, if our body's producing the right amount, it helps to regulate our heart, our blood pressure, our blood flow. Um, it helps to release glucose for energy. Uh, it helps works in the fight or flight response to threats. Uh, some aspects of the immune system, inflammation, alertness, memory, arousal, mood, our body's response to pain. Uh, so this is both a neurotransmitter and a hormone. And so it also works with uh, numerous organs throughout the body, like the liver, the lungs, the eyes, the adrenal glands, the gallbladder, the stomach, the kidneys, the bladder, things like that. Uh, doctors generally don't test norepinephrine levels. Um, they usually, if they diagnose somebody with having low uh, norepinephrine, then they'll base that uh, off of the symptoms that the person is experiencing. So dopamine is uh, dopamine is uh, another neurotransmitter that we have, and so dopamine helps to control uh, voluntary movement. Dopamine affects sleep, mood, attention, learning, and the ability to recognize rewards. Uh, low levels of dopamine are associated with Parkinson's disease, is what we often hear about with that. Uh, dopamine in general, uh, because it works with our reward system, you know, looks at pleasure and reward. And so it helps to regulate how we see and perceive the experiences around us. Um, and so your body should produce the right amount of dopamine, but like I said, with Parkinson's disease, this uh, can be caused by an imbalance in an area of your brain and the cells that make up the chemical dopamine start to die off, which affects this area of the brain that controls moving your body. Right. Uh, another medical condition associated with dopamine is schizophrenia. This is related to a reduced level of this hormone. Uh, so we need we need dopamine, right? Dopamine helps us um, <clears throat> to you know function, to sleep, to pay attention, um, to uh, feel. You know, um, some people refer to it as like the happy, the happy uh, neurotransmitter, happy hormone, because it helps with uh, pleasurable moments. You know, when we have a happy experience or a pleasurable situation that we've encountered, dopamine is released. And so that seeks out, you know, the person to do this activity over and over again. But on that, with that being said, it can also uh, cause problems with addiction. So drugs like cocaine or uh, amph uh, amphet uh, 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 amphetamines, amphetamines, Amphi I can't say the word amphetamines. Um, act as dopamine uh, reuptake inhibitors. Uh, this means that using uh, using them allows cocaine, or I'm sorry, allows dopamine to travel freely through the brain and creates this increased sense of well-being. Uh, so by increasing the dopamine levels in the brain, these pleasurable sensations are elevated, which means there's a higher risk of addiction, seeing how the person using the drugs might want to repeat the experience, which we know um, 
cocaine is one of the ones that are highly addictive and this is activating the reward center of the brain which has a direct link to our dopamine which could potentially cause problems uh, serotonin is another one of our neurotransmitters and serotonin uh, is involved in sleep regulation mood attention as well as learning and with serotonin <clears throat> we uh, we know it affects our mood it um, correlates with our digestion system um, so everywhere else in the Excuse me um most of your serotonin i believe it's 80 percent is found in your gut not in your brain and so not only do the intestines produce almost all of the serotonin supply but it's also required there to promote healthy digestion so elsewhere in the body serotonin helps with sleep it helps with sexual function bone health blood clotting um uh, are some of the other things that serotonin plays a role with and so if you remember back from the first slide when we talked about like what biological psychologists would want to study and we had hunger and sex linked together on the same page and I mentioned that they're both tied into serotonin well serotonin 80% is found in your gut right and so that's you know what what would help control hunger not hunger um, and you know and like I said it also um, plays a role with sexual function, right? And, and your uh, desire to um, participate in sexual acts. So <clears throat> serotonin effects in the brain could be um, helping to regulate our mood. It's kind of referred to sometimes as like your body's natural feel good chemical. So serotonin's influence on mood makes it one of the several brain chemicals that are integral to your overall sense of well-being uh, the serotonin contributes to your digestion system having normal bowel function reduces your appetite to help you know that when you're full um, it helps to regulate your sleep uh, as to when you sleep how much you sleep how well you sleep um, it doesn't you know regulate these tasks alone but you know dopamine is also a key role in and this as well as your uh, melatonin which is a hormone that's critical to the proper functioning of your sleep cycle uh, and then we look at GABA GABA keeps uh, many neurons from firing if we have low levels of GABA uh, we tend to see this in patients with anxiety and so this is a non-protein amino acid that functions as an inhibitory neurotransmitter throughout the CNS, throughout the central nervous system. <clears throat> uh, so this is um, it's a prime. It serves as like the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter between nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. Its natural function is binding to receptors uh, like GABA A and GABA B. It helps to block impulses between the nerve cells. It also plays a role in how people experience anxiety, fear, and stress. Um, without the right level of GABA activity in the body, nerve cells can be activated in ways that um, exasperate uh, certain conditions like anxiety disorders, which is the one that we see the, that we see it linked to the most. And then we have our endorphins and endorphins will stimulate uh, neurons firing they help to alleviate pain they elevate feelings of pleasure as well and with the you know kind of overall function of the endorphins that we see um, you know you sometimes hear like people that work out all the time uh, have this like high that they feel right and this this high after having a good workout is like these tiny neurochemicals released that by your body and these tiny little neurochemicals are called the endorphins and so while endorphins might make you feel good after a long jog or you know good workout there's a lot more you know in terms of how what role they play in regulating your body 
Um, so not all of the roles that endorphins play are completely understood, but we know that they're important to reduce pain as well as enhance pleasure. Um, so activities like eating, drinking, physical fitness, sexual intercourse, undulf and the endorphins are all, you know, a part of this natural reward circuit that goes on with these different activities. Uh, the endorphins uh, surge during pregnancy. They minimize discomfort and pain, and they maximize pleasure. They help us to continue functioning, sometimes despite injury or stress that we're feeling. You know, we naturally seek as humans to feel pleasure and avoid pain. We're more likely to do an activity if it makes us feel good. And then obviously from the evolutionary perspective in psychology, this would help ensure our survival. <clears throat> uh, and then the last one on here is the oxytocin and oxytocin is uh, the one that plays a role in the feelings of love uh, as well as human bonding is what we consider this one related to and in women uh, oxytocin is it's responsible for signaling contractions of the womb during labor so we also see it linked to that um, the hormone simulates the uterine muscles to contract and so labor will be will begin um, this is a uh, produced by the hypothalamus um, it's secreted by the pituitary gland in the brain so very important uh, for this to be functioning during labor and delivery um, and then once the baby is born the oxytocin promotes lactation it helps to move the milk into the breast. So when the baby sucks at the mother's breast, oxytocin secretion causes the milk to release so that the baby can feed. Uh, for men, oxytocin function is less important, but it does have a role in the moving of the sperm. It also appears to affect the production of testosterone in the testes. Studies that they've done on oxytocin also found that it's an important chemical messenger that controls some human behaviors like social interaction. It helps to trigger that bond between a mother and an infant. It may play a role in recognition, sexual arousal, trust, anxiety. Um, some of the research shows that the hormone may affect addiction and stress as well. So this is something that, you know, we want to ensure that these, you know, this hormone or any of the hormones really are functioning properly. Uh, if not, then an endocrinologist could be one that you could seek out to help better understand our, our neurotransmitters and the roles that they play in our own specific experiences and body. So the EEG is what we see pictured here. And uh, this records the electrical activity of the brain. When the, electro, uh, when the electrodes are placed on a person's scalp, they detect the brainwave activity, which you can see uh, the brainwaves recorded on the screen in the picture. Um, this is used to assess brain damage, epilepsy, other problems sometimes. Um, when I mentioned like, you know, sleep and dreams, we would do the EEG for that. <clears throat> uh, this single unit recording is used when a probe is inserted in or near an individual neuron. The probe transmits the electrical activity to an amplifier so that the researchers can see the activity. So that's your single unit recording of an EEG. So we do a PET scan or other kinds of neurotransmitting, uh, neuroimaging techniques or trying to understand the, the inner workings of our brain. We can do a CAT scan um, or a CT scan. This is like a three-dimensional image that's obtained through the x-rays of the head. The PET scan is um, what this slide talks more about, of looking at the glucose in various areas of the brains and sends this information to a computer where it's analyzed. If you've ever had an MRI that set magnetic field around a person's body and uses radio waves to construct images of the person's tissue and biomedical, biochemical activities. And so with the MRI, um, or we have a newer method, which is the fMRI, functional magnetic uh, uh, resonance image is what we see. This le helps to allow researchers to see what's happening in the brain while it's actually working. Um, but either of these would create a more detailed look. So sometimes you've had an x-ray done, that's just like your skeletal, right? That's to see if you have any broken bones. But if you do an MRI or an fMRI, that gets you more detailed look into like uh, looking at hotspots in the brain 
that aren't functioning or the body that aren't functioning right. It can look at like your muscles and your tendons and things like that. Um, I had a CAT scan done once and it wasn't for anything that you probably think of. And it was done for, uh, I actually had strep throat and I was like, I'm going to do a CAT scan for strep throat. But I, uh, I probably would have questioned it if I had not been so sick. Um, I had been on vacation. I was in Michigan. My son was going to spend the week with my friend. And so I went up there for a couple days, hung out and then drove, started to drive home. I ended up spending the night at another friend's house a couple hours from there. And by the time I got to this other person's house, I felt horrible. And I just, you know, I, I wasn't ready to admit that I was sick because I, I don't like being sick. Uh, and so I was like, Oh no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just, you know, kind of tired and I'm just going to go lay down. So I went and lay down. I slept all night. I felt so horrible in the morning and anybody that knows me knows it's going to take a lot to get me to the, go to the, the doctor, let alone a hospital. And, uh, I was about four hours from home though. And I'm get up in the morning and I left and I'm like, gosh, I'm not going to be able to make this drive home. Like I just felt so bad and it just hit me so fast. Like, you know, 24 hours before that morning, I was fine. And then, you know, as the day progressed and I got to my friend's house that night, I wasn't feeling good at all. And now it's the next morning and I just felt miserable. And so I found the closest ER and checked myself in. Uh, And like I said, I, I really had to be miserable to actually do this because I don't go, you know, to the doctors or let alone a hospital for anything unless I absolutely have to. And so I checked myself in, they put me in an IV because, you know, you're always dehydrated, you know, especially when you're sick, you're not drinking enough fluids. And they're like, well, we're going to do a CAT scan. Okay, whatever you got to do, because I was so out of it. I, you know, wasn't, wasn't quite thinking straight. And so I did the scan and everything. And I guess what they were looking for was like uh, growth nodules, because I, I, like I said, I had strep throat. And I guess I had just gotten so sick so fast um, and was having a super hard time swallowing. And yeah, that's, that's what they were looking for. So thankfully the test came back that I didn't have anything because I guess it would have been like a surgical procedure to remove them uh, if that was the case. And so that was the purpose of the CAT scan was to try and understand that, you know, what was going on in my throat and if I had anything. Um, but that was, I thought, very interesting to have a CAT scan done for strep throat. I never in a million years would have guessed that. And so I laid around, I was probably in the ER for like eight hours that day, not because they were busy or anything, because they really weren't, but I was just so sick, I, I needed to sleep. And so after being on, you know, antibiotics through the IV and just the IV fluids, uh, I, I was feeling better and was able to get up and drive home at that point. But that was, a, that was just a horrible, you know, 24 hour period until I started to feel a little bit better. And being so far from home and having to drive yourself home was, you know, no walk in the park for sure that day, but I made it. (laughs) So if you're in my class, you might see this type of diagram that shows up on the, on the, uh, on the exam, right? Uh, otherwise if you're, uh, you know, possibly in like an online class or just looking for more information on the different parts of the brain. We're going to talk about these a little bit anyways. And so the frontal lobe, as I mentioned earlier with Phineas Gage, we know personality is uh, a part of that. The forebrain, um, which is, you know, some of the frontal lobe as well, is like the limbic system, the thalamus, the basal ganglia, the hypothalamus, Uh, is part of that. The limbic system is important in both memory and emotion. There's the amygdala that's somewhat like an awareness center. It's like an almond shape in the center of the brain. Um, Your hippocampus is like a U shaped in the center of the brain and you have like the amygdala left and the amygdala right. Um, And so uh, the amygdala is also involved in emotional awareness and expression. The hippocampus is the formation of storage and memories. People that have hippocampus damage cannot retain new memories. So if you've seen the movie 51st Dates before with Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore um, and not her ability to not build new memories, 
that's the hippocampus part of our brain that was damaged. There's another guy that comes up, uh, I believe, in the memory chapter when we do that one. And EP, uh, so he's part of the um, Scientific America, like videos, clips that they do. And so he's got uh, an infection that hit the hippocampus part of his brain. And he also has the ability to not the inability to build new memories and this infection hit in like the I think it was sometime in the 90s mid to late 90s and then the video was done I don't know 2008 2010 something like that and so for that you know 10 15 year period of time he can't build anything new so he has these researchers that have you know come in and he worked with him and interviewed him and um, kind of tested his memory and they've been to his house like 200 times and he still has no idea who they are. He says that he feels like there's a sense of familiarity, um, but he hasn't, uh, he can't recall their names. Like they'll do tests with him in the video and they'll tell him like, a, you know, four or five animal names. And then 15 minutes later, ask him what it is and, you know, what animals were named. And he, he really has no idea. Uh, he's kind of an interesting one, but we'll typically watch his video in class. Otherwise, uh, you know, if anybody wants it, you can put the, just put a comment in the links underneath this PowerPoint and YouTube and I'll, I'll find the link for you and, and show it there. Uh, the thalamus is another important function of our brain. This helps to sort through information, send it to different appropriate places in the forebrain. Uh, the basal ganglia works with the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex in coordinating voluntary movements. The hypothalamus uh, monitors eating, drinking, social behavior, along with emotion, stress, and reward. Um, <clears throat> so the you know frontal lobe is behind the forehead, right? This is involved in control of voluntary muscles, intelligence, and personality. We talked about gauge, like I said a few minutes ago. That's part of that. Um, the prefrontal cortex is an important part of the frontal lobe. Um, is that uh, it's at the front of the motor cortex, the motor cortex is uh, involved in higher cognitive functionings like planning and reasoning, reasoning and self-control. Uh, if you've ever heard of lobotomies before, lobotomies have affected uh, the frontal frontal lobes of the brain, and so with the a lobotomy. It's like a form of psychosurgery, and so it's an ice pick that is pushed into the person's brain just above, uh, like above the eye, under the eyelid lid is how we would perform these. And what we see from people that have had lobotomies is um, like space, darkness, like a hole in their, that part of the brain where the lobotomy occurred. And because long-term planning and reasoning is found in the frontal lobe of the brain, uh, people that have had lobotomies aren't necessarily um, able to think, you know, long-term planning and and reasoning and things like that as part of it, as, as just part of development. Um, so we don't perform lobotomies. Uh, the last one I think was done maybe in the 70s. Um, we would typically do lobotomies for uh, kids that were having behavior problems, mental illness that we didn't understand at the time. You know, they're historically used to treat patients with psychological illnesses or behavior disorders. Uh, so talk therapy is what we've kind of used in replace of that. Um, on occasion, sometimes at its worst, lobotomies could cause death. But like I said, there's serious, you know, brain damage that can occur uh, as part of it, as part of having lobotomies. Uh, the parietal lobe is another um, part of our brain, one of the four lobes. And so this stretches across the top of our brain. So we have the parietal lobe on the left, parietal lobe on, lobe on the right. Um, it's kind of in the center or towards the rear of the head, spatial location, attention, motor control, 
Um, these are all part of it. So keep in mind though, that no two brains are exactly alike and the function of each of the lobes may differ slightly across individuals. The temporal lobes are like just above your ears on either side. This helps to process hearing, language processing and memory. Our occipital lobe is in the back of our head. This is, you know, in response to uh, anything visual, visual stimuli. The Broca's area is our ability to speak, our motor speech versus the sensory uh, speech is the Wernicke's side of the brain. So the Broca's helps us to say the words and then the sensory speech, the Wernicke side helps us to uh, understand and interpret that. Um, the pons is uh, in the hindbrain that connects to the cerebral cortex with the medulla oblongata. It serves as a communication uh, and coordination center between the two hemispheres of the brain. Uh, <clears throat> the, let's see what else is on here. The medulla uh the medulla oblongata, that one helps us to uh, affect your breathing, help to regulate your breathing. Its main function is to send the signals to the muscle that controls respiration, which causes our breathing to occur. Uh, it's the lowest part of the brain, as well as the lowest portion of the brain stem. Uh, you can see right next to the sensory, um, Wernicke's area is the reading comprehension. So that, you know, helps us to understand what it is that we're reading and process it. Uh, and then the last one on here is the uh, cerebellum. And so this is a part of the brain that kind of plays a, a vital role in like all physical movement, basically. So your ability to throw a ball to walk across the, the room um, is all because of the cerebellum. It helps assist people with eye movement and vision. Um, usually if there's a problem with the cerebellum, it's mostly involved in movement uh, and maybe coordination issues as well that the person might have. So just to give you a little bit more on each of the each of the lobes that we have. So the frontal lobe, cognition, problem solving, reasoning, motor skills, uh, parts of speech, impulse control, spontaneity, uh, regulating emotions, sexual urges, planning, you know, all things that we see in the frontal lobe, uh, most of which center on regulating social behavior. Um, those are, you know, the main things associated with that though. The parietal lobe, we see sensation, perception, spatial reasoning, um, like sensing pain or pressure or touch, regulating your the five senses of your body, movement, visual orientation, speech, uh, visual perception, recognition, cognition, and information processing are all part of that. Um, damage to this can sometimes cause issues with reading, writing, spatial reasoning, understanding uh, symbols and language. If the right side is damaged, this can affect the person's ability to dress or like groom yourself. If you're the left side is damaged, we see language disorders. We see disorders with perception. Um, <clears throat> the temporal lobe, right, located on both sides of the brains, close to the ears. So auditory processing sounds is the main function. Uh, since the hippocampus or the part of the brain responsible for transferring short-term memories into long-term memories is located in the temporal lobe, the temporal lobe helps to form long-term memories and process new information. Uh, this uh, temporal lobe also helps with the formation of visual and verbal memories, the interpretation of smells and sounds. So damage to this, you know, and what happens depends on where the damage in the lobe occurs. So if there's temporal lobe damage, it can sometimes have difficulty with auditory processing, sensations, visual perceptions, problem concentrating, long-term memory problems, changes in personality, changes in sexual behavior. So you can see there are some overlaps across the lobes, but again, it depends on what part of the lobe is damaged. Uh, the occipital lobe is, you know, visual spatial processing, movement and color recognition. 
So there's uh, the skull protects it, so injury is less likely to occur, but severe damage to the occipital lobe can uh, usually result, result in a variety of visual problems, including the loss of color recognition, sometimes visual hallucinations, illusions, problems recognizing objects uh, is all part of the occipital lobe and problems that we may see. All right, so these are the different parts to the neuron, if you're not familiar with the neuron. Um, and so the cell body, this is the part that contains the nucleus that manufactures what the neurons need for growth as well as maintenance. The dendrites receive the information and send it on to the cell body and are sometimes considered like tree-like structures in terms of how they look. The axon carries the information away from the cell body and to other cells. The myelin sheath covers the axon. It helps to protect it, um, helps to speed it up. Uh, the degenerative nerve disorder called multiple sclerosis occurs when there's a breakdown of the myelin sheath. So that's typically where we see MS come from. Uh, neurons, so in general, are the cells that control the information processing function. And so mirror neurons play a role in imitation. So these are activated when we perform an action or observe others in action. These neurons are implicated in empathy and understanding. The glial cells provide support and nutrition to the nervous system. So not all neurons are alike, but they all have you know, these parts, the cell body and the dendrites and the axon and the myelin sheath and, and that kind of thing. Um, we'll take a look at some pictures of uh, neur neurons that my students made in, in other classes. So you can see the different interpretations that the students had when it comes to making models. These, these are all food models. So you can see in this picture on the left hand side, the marshmallow um, was our cell body. The little red cherry drop thing was the nucleus. The little pieces of licorice represent the dendrites. And then you have the pretzel sticks with the some kind of sour, sour worm or something was used to represent the axon and the, the myelin sheath. And then the other two pictures, you can see the marshmallows were used as the myelin sheath. The axon would run through there. Uh, and then you can see the dendrites and the cell body and the nucleus that were made too. So they had a, they had a fun time making these. Okay, so plasticity in the brain or its capacity for repair. Um, you know, is, is very important, uh, especially when it comes to any kind of brain damage that's gone on. Uh, you know, research has been conducted on patients with brain damage to help determine how well the brain can repair itself. So recovery from the brain damage sometimes depends on the age of the individual and the extent of the damage. So obviously a young child's brain has more plasticity than an older child because of its immaturity, um, but it's also more vulnerable to problems too sometimes, or insults as we call them. Much of the brain's ability to repair itself depends on whether the neurons are damaged, uh, whether or not that damaged area has been completely destroyed or not. If the neurons were not totally destroyed, then brain function can slowly be restored over time. Uh, collateral sprouting is one way in which the brain can repair itself. In this process, the axons on adjacent neurons grow more branches. Substitution of function is a second way the brain can repair itself. When this happens, uh, another area of the brain takes over the functions of the damaged area. Neurogenesis is the process through which new neurons are generated. So research suggests that the neurogenesis in humans can occur in the hippocampus, the area involved in memory. <clears throat> but in other mammals, uh, neurogenesis has been found in the olfactory bulb and the olfactory bulb is responsible for our sense of smell. Uh, brain grafts are implants of healthy tissue into damaged brains. The most successful cases of these brain grafts occur when the tissue for the implants comes from the fetal stage. The use of stem cells has been hotly debated in recent years, but stem cells are unique because they have the ability to develop into most types of cells.
So split brain is when the corpus callosum, which is like the nerve-like um, fibers, connect the left and the right hemisphere. Right. So in the 50s and 60s, Roger Sperry performed experiments on cats, monkeys, and humans to study the functional differences between the two hemispheres of the brain. So to do so, um, he studied the corpus callosum. So these are the neurons that connect the two hemispheres. And he severed the corpus callosum in cats and monkeys to study the function of each side of the brain. And what he found is that the hemispheres were not connected. They functioned independently of one another which he recalled a split brain. So the split brain enabled animals to memorize double the information. And then he later tested the same idea in humans with their corpus callosum severed as treatment for epilepsy, which is a seizure disorder. He found that hemisp hemispheres in human brains had different functions. The left hemisphere interpreted languages, but not the right. Um, he did... Uh, share this Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1981 for his split brain research. He also studied different aspects of the brain function as well beyond just the split brains, but that's what he's most known for. Um, but, but this is a, something that we, you know, we will practice for, you know, severe epilepsy um, and the seizures. There was a case too that happened, um, I want to say, maybe around 2010. Um, there was a girl who suffered from seizures and she had half of her brain removed. I want to say it's the left, the left hemisphere. She was six years old at the time and this was in Baltimore and so far, so good. You know, like she, we took half of her brain, a little different than what we see with the split cell, um, or the, I'm sorry, the split brain. Uh, but she is, as of today, she's, I believe, 13 or 14 years old. Um, and she's, she's been fine. You know, she still has like this kind of bubbly personality. And, you know, she had some rare brain disease that caused uh, seizures and, uh, Rasmussen's encephalitis, I believe is what it's called. Um, I might be off on her age now, but everything suggests that she has done just, uh, just fine really in bouncing back. Um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know that, that she had a problem. So, but what that means is that the half of her brain that you know, is still intact, ended up kind of compensating and relearning and, you know, able to do some of the things that, that the missing hemisphere, you know, would have been, would have done. But she had this done, you know, pretty early in childhood. And so this is where that plasticity kind of comes into play again. Um, she could still speak normal, think normally. She did have some movement limitation and slight nerve damage, which affected her left arm. But now, you know, she's, she's fairly normal in life. Um, and, you know, functioning, functioning well for having half of her brain removed. So the, this chapter covers a little bit on genetics too. Um, so you can see this talks a little bit about the dominant and recessive genes, but we also look at, uh, <clears throat> You know, behavior genetics in general is the study of the degree and the nature of hereditary's influence on behavior. We look at twin studies a lot um, to look at behavior genetics and to study the extent to which individuals are shaped by their hereditary and influence on the environment. The behavioral similarity of identical twins is compared to the behavioral similarity of fraternal twins. Um, there is the Human Genome Project, which has led to the use of genome-wide association method to identify genetic variations that are linked to particular diseases. This has had a lot of uh, impact um, in helping people recover from different diseases, as well as just getting a better sense of the genetic abnormalities that can occur within the genes. Uh, a genotype is a person's genetic heritage. The phenotype is a person's observable characteristics. So the phenotype is influenced by the genotype, 
but also by environmental factors. Um, so if you look at the gene and the environment, the interaction suggests that if, even if people share genetic similarities, they're still likely to be different. Environmental experiences in a person's life will influence the expression or not of a particular gene. So there's always research going on, you know, when we examine the genes and genetics and how things are passed from one generation to the next. Okay, that's about going to wrap up this slide and presentation. And we will move on to the next one.